everyone! Welcome to Water Bear Reads where I chat about illustrated classics and modern classics. My name is Heather. I just want to say thank you to everyone who subscribed to my channel over the summer. I'm so glad that you're here and you enjoy my content enough to subscribe. It really means a lot to me, so thank you so much for that. I thought that I would theme this video after all the final blooms of the season. In my intro you can see the purple loose strife and the goldenrod. And here behind me I have some wild aster as well as the hydrangeas in their final stages. They take on this sort of rose color, which is really beautiful. So I wanted to feature them in a video. I was going to do apples, but then a friend of mine stopped by with a massive bushel of these hydrangeas and I thought I had to do something with them, so I changed the theme of my video. This is my final gladiola of the season. I went ahead and cut it for this video. And it's always the prettiest one that comes out last. It sort of has this peachy look to it with these a beautiful cream inside. It's one of my favorite flowers that bloom in my garden and it's always kind of the last. My zinnias are still doing fine though. They're doing great. What I usually do this time of year is I wait for news of the first frost and as soon as I hear of a frost coming I'll go and cut all my flowers. Um, and bring them inside and just enjoy them. Today I wanted to share another read a book by the decade list. My son and I do these reading lists where we read one book from each decade and this one will have sort of an autumnal lean. Unlike my previous read a book by the decade list where I would recommend a book for read aloud that children as well as adults will like. Some of these titles will be books that I feel are more appreciated by adults than they are maybe children. Before we get started I just wanted to show you this mug that I painted. One of my friends, the same friend who brought me all these hydrangeas, we went to paint some ceramics and I was inspired because we had this grapevine that grows on the trellis on the back of our house and underneath the grapevine is a little chipmunk. He lives underneath the grapevine in a little hole. But anyway, I was inspired by my chipmunk friend who we call Ricky Ticky, by the way. <laughs> and then on the other side, I painted apples. It's apple season, so I decided to kind of make it my sort of early autumnal September mug. I am drinking lemongrass chai, by the way. My mom and I love this. We buy them all the time and um, it's nature's guru. Um, unsweetened, no preservatives. I have to put it down because my hand is burning on this side. They have different flavors, cardamom, ginger. I always enjoy drinking these in the autumn months. Well, let's get to the books. I'm gonna take a sip of my lemongrass chai and we'll get started. The first one I want to show you from the 1800s we actually read as part of our summer reading list. I had just assumed it was a good book to read in the summer. But the more I read, the more I started to feel like, no, you know, this really feels more like autumn to me. And that book is Treasure Island. I have two versions of this one. I have um, the Illustrated Junior Library as well as Robert Ingpen's Treasure Island and I love both of them. We were really excited to read this because it is hands down one of the most referenced children's classics in literature. So many books in our sphere of books that we would pick up would reference Treasure Island. I put it off forever because I really thought it was going to be boring. <laughs> but it is not. It is so exciting. Why I thought it was for fall? Well, I think it begins in the late autumn. The first time it ever mentions a date is on the second chapter. It mentions being in January. But Billy Bones has been at Admiral Benbow Inn for a while and when he arrives there um, is a fire, they're wearing coats, so it makes me feel like it begins in the autumn. But it's not just that. When the story really starts to take off and really starts to get momentum, is when um, Jim Hawkins overhears a conversation when he's inside an apple barrel and he's sitting in this apple barrel and he hears something that changes the course of what happens. We follow Jim Hawkins at the Admiral Benbow with his ailing father and his mother. They take in a boarder, uh, Billy Bones, who calls himself a captain, and Billy Bones um, pays at first but then stays afterwards without paying and he's kind of a bit of a bully. Anytime Jim Hawkins' dad tries to get money that Billy Bones owes him, he, he kind of gets a little bullyish. You really kind of get very annoyed with this character at first and then you have a really great time when the family doctor comes over and steers him down and really puts him in his place and then you find out Billy Bones isn't that much of a bully. <laughs> 
after all. I really enjoyed that part. Billy Bones, who has a ton of enemies, dies of natural causes. Jim Hawkins and his mom find this treasure map on him, and they know that there are other people out there who are after this treasure map, so they go seek help. And they are joined by Dr. Livesey, the doctor who stared Billy Bones down that I mentioned earlier, and a very interesting crew. And I won't tell you anything further, but I really enjoyed this. It was exciting. Now, I will say that there were some chapters where I had to Google what was going on. I'm not great at boat talk or or pirate talk, boat references, I am completely lost. But there are other chapters which are so exciting. They go fast, scary at times. I have to say this has become one of my favorite classics in children's literature and I'm surprised because I really did think I was going to be bored by it. There are a couple of things I just wanted to mention. It is the first time in children's literature where we have come across a human being murdering another human being. And the other thing I wanted to mention real quick is there's a lot of drinking. It's a great read aloud, but I would recommend just making sure that your kids are at an age where you're comfortable with that. But yeah, it was just such a good book. This was illustrated by Norman Price, and he's a Canadian-American illustrator. He also did the illustrated uh, library edition of The Three Musketeers, a nice full page spread. And they're so beautiful too. Here's some of the Robert Ingpen. So we have that one. Here's a good one as well. So yeah, published in 1882. Treasure Island. I referenced this next book in my previous video, which was about the illustrated versions of The Wizard of Oz, and that is The Marvelous Land of Oz, Wizard of Oz number two. The Marvelous Land of Oz is a great book to read this time of year because one of the most instrumental and heartfelt characters in the book is Jack Pumpkinhead. We follow Tip, and Tip is a prisoner of the witch Mombi. It's actually kind of an interesting relationship because he's her prisoner, but he also likes to play tricks on her. So one day she is away visiting this um, old wizard who lives in the mountains, and he um, decides, no, he's going to play a trick on old witch Mombi. So he puts together a couple of sticks, and he carves a pumpkin, and he puts the pumpkin on the top of the sticks, and he dresses this pumpkin. And in very Frank Baum fashion, it's described, you know, what he puts on the pumpkin head, purple pants and a white polka dot vest and such. He sets the pumpkin head up someplace where he thinks it's going to scare Mombi, and she doesn't get scared at all. In fact, she sees it as an opportunity and she takes this powder of life, sprinkles it all over Jack Pumpkinhead and he comes to life and he becomes such an endearing, wonderful character. Mombi threatens to turn Tip into a marble statue for what he tried to do to her. So he runs away and he takes Jack with him and he also, by the way, steals her power, powder of life. They take off and then starts the adventure. They head towards the Emerald City who is being ruled by the Scarecrow. Frank Baum's Oz books are so easy to read. I've been holding this guy up and it's just a vintage version that I have that has an illustrated cover by um, Don Lupo. It just has one illustration by Don Lupo and then the rest of them are John R. Neal's illustrations. He's the one who took over illustrating the Oz books after W.W. W. Denslow and Frank Baum parted ways. There's this one scene that also makes it really great for this time of year where there's this sunflower field that is magic, just like the poppy field in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And I just wanted to show you that illustration real quick. By the time this had come out, the Scarecrow and the Tin Man had become a thing. There were theater productions with the Tin Man and the Scarecrow at that time. But here's another one that's with Jack Pumpkinhead. I just wanted to show you what the original illustrations look like. However, we actually read this one. I didn't want to hold this up because I was worried it would be confusing if I held up The Wonderful Wizard of Oz while I was talking about The Marvelous Land of Oz. I didn't talk about it very much in my previous video because I knew I was going to be showing it to you guys in this video. But I did tell you about the Gillikin country. In the second book, The Marvelous Land of Oz actually begins in the Gillikin country. And it's kind of nice learning about the purple land, um, the Gillikin country, which is pretty cool. It's illustrated by Chris Sasson, who is an illustrator out of the Philippines. And he has color illustrations in the beginning. And then the rest are all black and white. There's that one. 
That's when he's carving the pumpkin. Jack comes to life, and there's the witch mombi. And here's when they're running away. And there's also these wonderful full page spreads. Whether or not you're a fan of manga, this is a good one to go with because it's got a ton of very modern illustrations. If you are a fan of the movie Return to Oz, you might recognize the Gump as well. Um, Jack Pumpkinhead and the Gump I, uh, are, base, are the only two characters, I think, that are in Return to Oz that are in the marvelous land of Oz. The rest of them, the Hen Bellina and TikTok and the Wheelers, they're in the third book, Ozma of Oz, just in case you're wondering. I love Return to Oz. It's one of my favorite movies from my childhood. The next one started out as a theatrical play by J.M. Barry, a Scottish playwright, and it was published in book format in 1911, and that is Peter Pan. I know that Peter Pan, like Treasure Island, doesn't immediately make you think of Autumn, but there are so many elements in it that do. First of all, there's the skeleton leaf that Mrs. Darling finds, where most of the flesh is gone, but she can still tell that it's from somewhere not in England. And then there's the acorn that Peter Pan gives to Wendy, that Wendy hangs around her neck that later saves her life. There's also a warm fire in the nursery. And when Peter Pan is just about to take the kids to Neverland, they've been flying around and such, um, Liza, who's been in the kitchen, is interrupted. She's busy making the Christmas puddings and Christmas puddings tended to be made traditionally about five weeks ahead of time so we're probably looking at this book taking place around mid-November sometime. There is a reference to the story of Cinderella and I always think of Cinderella as happening in the autumn with its pumpkin that gets turned into a carriage. Let me show you some of their artwork. There's that. And these beautiful chapter illustrations. Mina Lima did a great job at giving it that autumnal feel. Here's on the island. Oh yeah, and that's the other thing. When they're in Neverland, there's to toadstools. Captain Hook sitting on a toadstool. Chapter heading illustration. And this is in the Lost Boys Den when they go down the trees. I thought that was really cool. Published in 1927, I have for you one of the most difficult yet rewarding children's books I have come across and this will be one of them that I recommend that's more for adults who enjoy reading children's literature and that is John Macefield's The Midnight Folk. We tried reading this book as a read aloud and in the end we ended up DNFing it as a read aloud. I went ahead and finished it and, and read it to myself but it just didn't quite work as a read aloud and, and the reason is because First of all, there's no chapters. It's just one continuous story. And that always kind of makes it difficult because it's hard to find places to break. And then when you come back to remember what was happening, I was trying to figure out why exactly that is. And I think for me, when there are a lot of characters being introduced, but not a lot of description attached to those characters, it makes it difficult to keep track of who is who. I think we got about a third of the way in and we looked at each other and we neither of us had any clue what was happening. So I took it aside and I started at the beginning and I, and I started reading it. And I found even reading it to myself that I had to really pay attention to who's who in the story. And I ended up actually taking out a notebook and every time I came across a new character, I would um, write down that character's name and any description that is attached to that character just so I could re reference it. If you keep reading, it's actually really rewarding. And I think a very interesting to read from a history of children's book fantasy. I don't know if J.K. Rowling gives credit to it, but there are a lot of elements in here that I see in J.K. Rowling's work as well elements like paintings that that move. Kay Harker at one point steps into a painting, those kind of things. There's other elements as well and I don't want to spoil it for you so I don't want to tell you too much. I, I actually looked it up to find out why it was written in the way it was written and why it was written without chapters and kind of almost like a continuous story and I think John Macefield's writing strategy was to make it feel like it's part of a dream. I read this one article that likened it to a Marc Chagall painting, and I have to agree, it very much feels like that. But it's a rather rewarding story. We follow Kay, 
and K is living in a large house. He has governesses and someone who looks out for him, but he has no parents. One just assumes his parents have passed away. There's a bit of family history of there being a treasure. His great-great-grandfather came across a treasure but lost it and it haunted him. One night K wakes up to a scratching noise and he comes to find out that it's this talking cat named Nibbins and Nibbins takes him on this broom and then they head off into the night and they come across this um, coven of witches who's being led by a wizard of sorts and he overhears them discussing this treasure and how they're trying to find this treasure. He keeps getting visited at night by different creatures or different people or seeing things at night around midnight, which give him clues to what happened to this treasure. But he always wakes up in the morning and you're left wondering whether it was a dream or not, but then something will happen during the daytime that will prove that it was an actual fact, an actual occurrence. It's a very rewarding read once you get through it and once you get into it and you understand who's who and you can stay on top of it. That was my experience anyway. I'm a character person. Whenever I'm faced with a book that has a large quantity of characters but not a lot of character description, I kind of struggle with those kind of books, whereas I know other people may not. But I did really love it once I got going. Let me show you a couple of um, pictures. This is by Quentin Blake. And I know that the New York Review has a version as well as a beautiful version by the Folio Society illustrated by Sarah Ogilvie. So I would kind of like to get one of those. But I also read, um, there's another illustration. It was really nice to have Quentin Blake's illustrations in this. I also read that The Box of Delights, the second one, isn't as difficult to read as this one is. I believe that one's a great one to read at Christmas time. The reason I thought of it for Autumn is it's full of witches and wizards and talking owls and mystery and it starts off with School Lessons, The Sword and the Stone by T.H. White, published in 1938. Actually, it was published in 1938 and then revised for an American audience in 1939 and then revised again in 1958. And normally I wouldn't bore you with those details, but there are some pretty significant differences <laughs> in the books, which I really feel like I need to tell you because just so you're not confused, we read this beautifully illustrated um, version by Dennis Nolan while listening to the audiobook because The Sword in the Stone is a bit chatty, and I felt like if we listened to the audiobook while looking at the pictures, it would, it would be easier to read, and it was. The only thing is, is that it was weird because we were listening to the audiobook and reading along with it, and then things started to be different. I came to realize that the audiobook we were listening to was the 1939 version that he edited for the American audience, and this one was the 1938 original version. I would recommend actually it going with the 1939 version. And the reason is because the things that he changed for the American audience actually make it way cooler. There's an ep chapter where the wart and Kay meet Robin Hood and Maid Marian and Little John in the forest. And at one point, a humanoid character called an Anthropomorgi is shot and killed. When T.H. White rewrote it, he substituted that creature for a griffin and he also added in Morgan Le Fay, the evil fairy queen. So that's why I would go with the 1939 version. I'm totally nerding out right now. I actually wrote a blog post about this. <laughs> so I'll link it below if I'm not making sense and you're curious and you want to know more. So we follow the wart. He is living with Sir Ector and his adopted brother Kay. Sir Ector is his guardian. One day he's lost in the woods and he comes across this stone cottage and this stone cottage belongs to this old man who has an owl called Archimedes and we come to know and love Merlin. And Merlin is to become the wart's teacher. And he's not your average teacher, can shape shift and he turns the wart into all kinds of different creatures. A snake, an owl, a fish. Merlin is also great because he lives his time backwards. And whenever I think of Autumn, I think of wizards and witches. There's some great scenes in here where they visit Robin Hood and Maid Marian and Little John, like I told you about. And what I particularly loved about those parts is that Maid Marian is 
made to be a very tough lady. She's beautiful and all that, but she's also smart and can make it through the forest brush faster than any of the men. There was this almost Don Quixote-like character, a character called King Pelinor, a very old knight, errant, and he just keeps getting himself into these situations and scrapes and fights. And we laughed so hard. My son at one point threw his head back and laughed. All that said, this book is chatty. There's also a lot of sophisticated language. So in many ways, I guess I could say that this is really a better book for adults to appreciate because it's not just the sophisticated language. It's that there's a lot of references to things that a child may not catch. There's a lot of reference made to things that are in T.H. White's time that we might know because we've been exposed to a lot of history and a lot of movies. Adults know them by that time you, you, you have a certain exposure that so for the most part you know what he's talking about but children may not know about that so that's why it might be better appreciated by adults than children. However as a read aloud you can always explain things. This one is illustrated by Dennis Nolan who is based in the San Francisco Bay Area and is beautifully illustrated. T.H. White himself did some illustrations, some just simple illustrations that are as simple as they are. They're actually really cool. And I'm gonna do a cutaway and show you some of those illustrations. And here's another good one. I'll do a cutaway because I ordered the book from the library so that I could show you guys and then I totally forgot to go fetch it. <laughs> it's sitting there waiting for me and I forgot about it. T.H. White's illustrations are simple and yet they're so cool. And my ideal would be if someone would illustrate the 1939 version but leave T.H. White's illustrations in there in addition to some color illustrations because there's so many scenes in this book that are lush and I think it would be an illustrator's paradise. So that is what I wish. One of my favorite chapters is when the wart gets changed into an owl and he's taken to visit the goddess Athena and Athena slows down time so that the wart can hear the trees and the rocks having conversations. And it is the most beautiful chapter and I just love that chapter. Sometimes I just re-listen to that chapter where the, all the different types of trees are talking to each other and describing their attributes and it's just really beautiful. I wanted to read you this one quote that just gets me every time. The best thing for disturbances of the spirit, replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow, is to learn. That is the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love and lose your monies to a monster. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics or know your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for then to learn. I go by sea, I go by land by P.L. Travers, the author of Mary Poppins. And it's an epistolary novel that's an account of two children who have to be evacuated from um, London during the Blitz and they're evacuated to relatives who are living in um, New York City. It's an account of Sabrina and she's 11 and she's the one writing the diary entries and her brother James. It's 1941 and the bombings have begun and in order to escape the Blitz, their parents are sending them away to go live with relatives in New York. The book is divided into two parts. One is I Go By Sea and that's an account of the ship ride over to Canada. That part is actually very exciting because it discusses how the British Navy had to protect the ship that had all the children on it. I found that very fascinating. And then the second part of the book is I Go By Land, and that is an account of Sabrina and James's experiences coming down the train from Canada to New York and, and how they discover so many cool American things. P.L. Travers in the beginning of the book does chat a little bit about how this was based on a real person's experience and how she doesn't want to say the name of the home where they came from or of the place where they came from or the real names of the children because World War II is still happening around them and she just wanted to protect them just in case. It's illustrated by Gertrude Herms, who is a British illustrator. This is in America when the children are chronicling all the different kinds of bird species and plant life when they went to go visit the Statue of Liberty.
when they were there. In my previous Read a Book by the Decade Autumn video, I actually spoke of this book and I wanted to talk about it again because I have since reading the first one in the series, I've read two more in the series, and that is All of a Kind Family, All of a Kind Family Downtown, and more All of a Kind Family. And in my previous video, I told you that I had read this because there's a picture book, All of a Kind Family Hanukkah, that I had read throughout my son's younger years. And I wanted to find that chapter in one of the books. And it turned out that it actually is not in the first two books, but it does make an appearance in more All of a Kind Family. It, you find the Hanukkah scenes in there. The book I wanted to zoom in, especially for this video, is All of a Kind Family Downtown. It begins on a very cold November day and goes around the sun and ends on Thanksgiving the next year. This is the second in the series, although a lot of people actually think that more All of a Kind Family is the second. The publisher wouldn't publish it because its content was a bit heavier and so it wasn't published until 1972 later. All of a Kind Family Downtown follows the lives of five girls and now a baby brother they meet this boy who is a victim of poverty and it's about how they help this boy and lead him to a better life, a better existence. And it's really beautiful. Each chapter has kind of a viewpoint from each one of the sisters or the siblings. The story kind of centers around one of them per chapter. It has references to Aladdin and a Andrew Lang's Red Fairy book. It was illustrated by a husband and wife team, Beth and Joe Crush, who met while studying art at the Philadelphia Museum School of Art. And I really love their illustrations. Those cricket magazines that I talk about now and then have a lot of their, their illustrations in them as well. This is that cold November day that starts the book out. I think that's Gertie who's sitting by the fire. Henny is the sister who is always getting into mischief. And here she was hiding in a barrel as well. Not an apple barrel, this one's a sugar barrel. <laughs> then it ends with Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to remember. It also has the Jewish holidays of Simchas Torah in it. In more All of a Kind family, if you are reading these to learn a little bit more about Jewish holidays, Yom Kippur is the featured holiday. So is Hanukkah. There's also Hanukkah in here. They're all illustrated by different illustrators. So Downtown is illustrated by Beth and Joe Crush. More is by Sidney Taylor. And I think it's Helen Johns did the original All of, a All of a Kind Family. This third one, I just finished reading and I wanted to tell you about it because it's also my very first buddy read. Celeste from A Reader's Almanac and I read this together. And so I had so much fun chatting with her about it on email and discussing it. It was really cool. I think it has a lot of value in learning not to judge people by their outward appearance and also in learning to deal with big life changes. This one has a bit more romance in it. There's a wedding in it. As I said before, it has Yom Kippur in it, which occurs in October, at least this year it occurs in October. It also has Hanukkah in it, which is in, usually in December, end of November. Also, it has spring references and summer references. There's something for every season. I really love that it has references to Anna Green Gables and Anne of F Avonlea, as well as Little Lord Fauntleroy. Um, one of the things about these books that Celeste mentioned that I really agree with as well is that these books tackle social problems. They tackle things that are in the atmosphere of the time and they bring it to light and don't underestimate children just like All of a Kind Family Downtown spoke about poverty and its effects on people, more All of a Kind Family uh, discusses um, po the polio epidemic that happened in 19 1916 that was especially bad in Brooklyn. It's a history lesson as well when you're reading them. I love all these girls and the character and the little baby brother Charlie is adorable as well. Let me show you some of these illustrations real quick. This one's by Mary Stevens. And there's the chapter on Hanukkah. And I just want to say thank you, Celeste, so much for uh, reading this book along with me. My first buddy read. I had never done that before. <laughs> so that was really fun to do. My 1950s recommendation, All of a Kind Family Series. So now we are in the 1960s and published in 1960, we have The Incredible Journey by Sheila Burnford. I picked up this version with cover illustration by Emily Sutton 
in Hatchards when my mother and I were in London a few years back. And it's just really pretty. I love Emily Sutton's artwork as well. It does have interior artwork as well by George Heaven who does these rather small but valuable chapter heading illustrations. There's one. There's another one, a porcupine. We follow the, the Hunter family who are living in Ontario, Canada, and they have three pets. Luoth, who is the Golden Retriever, Bodger, who is the Bull Terrier, and Tao, who is the Siamese Cat. And the Hunter family have to go to England because the father of the family has to give these lectures at a university in London. And they leave their pets in the care of a good friend who lives out on a farm. This good friend at some point decides to go hunting and he then in turn leaves these three animals in the care of another person. But he write, leaves a note and the note gets misplaced and so this other lady that's come to look after them doesn't realize that he didn't take the three pets with him when he went hunting. So Luth and Bodger and, and Tao have taken off and nobody knows that they're gone. They travel through the Canadian wilderness, they're headed for home, and they have hundreds of miles to cover. They encounter wild animals, they almost starve to death, they almost that drown. There's a lot of adventure. There's a movie that they made about it. It's called Homeward Bound. What I love the most about this is Sheila Burnford. You can tell that she knows her animals, that her, she knows dogs and cats. The way that she puts herself in their mind and the way that they think. They're not talking animals. I'm actually not a person who minds talking animals. I know that a lot of people do, but it's never been something that bothers me. But it is still nice, though, to just be inside of their heads and to see the world through their eyes and hear their thoughts and kind of have that experience of being both inside and outside the story. So anyway, I read this to my son. He also enjoyed it. It's a beautiful book from the 1960s, The Incredible Journey. Now we are in the 1970s and I had two books in mind to recommend for this decade. I decided not to choose between the two but just to mention both of them and one just to do real quick because I have already spoken about it so much. The funny thing about these books is both of them were originally written in German and both of them were published in 1979. I did not plan it that way. The first one is The Never Ending Story. This one is set on a cold November day when Bastion walks into the bookshop. And I just wanted to tell you guys about it because it was just such a great book to read in November. The other one that I'm gonna tell you about and really focus on for the 1970s is The Little Vampire. Written by Angela Sommer Bodenberg, who now lives in New Mexico. It's just a wonderful book, a real hit with my son. When we finished reading this, he dressed up like a vampire for like a week. We follow Tony, who is one day alone at home. His parents have gone out and Rudolph lands on his windowsill and he is a vampire. And Tony at first is not very friendly, but then they bond over a book, Dracula. Tony lands Rudolph his Dracula Soon they become friends and they share a bond over this book. And also Frankenstein is brought up as well. It's a really sweet, cute story. Rudolph takes Tony home to meet his family and Tony learns all about vampires and how they work. And um, there's one family member that you have to look out for. There's a couple of movies that have come out. They've actually made two movies. One is, I think it was 2005 when it came out, and it has that little boy, that cute little boy who's in Jerry Maguire. I don't know what his name is, but he's adorable. And then the other one is um, a recent one that's kind of become a holiday favorite for us. It's an animated version. I just wanted to recommend this because it was such a hit for my son, and now that he's reading on his own, there's many, many other books in the series. This one has cover art by Daniel Duncan, as well as the same exact image on the inside. But other than that, there's only tiny repetitive chapter heading illustrations. So yeah, it's not really illustrated, unfortunately. It's such an easy read, but if you would like to get the illustrated version, there's an older illustrated version that you can get and I'll pop it up there for you. Now we are in the 1980s and the book I wanna show you is a book that I've wanted to show you guys for a while, but I've never felt like I can do it justice. But it really is a book that I need to share because it's just so good and it's so valuable. And that is The People Could Fly 
by Virginia Hamilton, illustrated by Leo and Diane Dillon. Virginia Hamilton's ancestors were slaves, and she wanted to tell these stories in a book for children but her goal was to make them accessible for everybody so that everybody can share in these tales because she believes that they speak of humanity it's just beautiful and the reason that i'm recommending it for this time of year is because there's four different sections and i really think that each section is good for a certain time of year but one of the sections which is um, tales of the supernatural has some very eerie scary stories in it and which I think is great to read if you're somebody who likes to read those kind of stories this time of year. There's animal tales, which I think would be great to read in the spring. And then there's tales of the fanciful, which I think would be great for winter. And then at the very back, they have tales of freedom, which I think would be great to read in summer around Juneteenth because they're beautiful and they're about the hopes and dreams of slaves. The section, Tales of the Supernatural, would be great to read around Halloween time or around this time of year. In the very beginning, Virginia Hamilton leaves an introduction, and I wanted to read a passage from her introduction to you. It is amazing that the former Africans could ever smile and laugh, let alone make up riddles and songs and jokes and tell tales. As slaves, they were forced to live without citizenship, without rights, as property like horses and and cows belonging to someone else. But no amount of hard labor and suffering could suppress their powers of imagination. And they are tales of humanity, as Virginia Hamilton goes on to say down here. She says, These tales were created out of sorrow, but the hearts and minds in the black people who formed them, expanded them, and passed them on to us were full of love and hope. We must look on the tales as a celebration of the human spirit. It's a remarkable set of stories. I wanted to show you a couple of the illustrations. So you might recognize this one. That's Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby. That was one of my favorites when I was a little kid. And this is a variant on um, Little Red Riding Hood in a way. Leo and Diane Dillon were an illustrator couple and they illustrated many, many children's books, um, including that one book, uh, Why Do Mosquitoes Buzz in Your Ears? Leo was actually the first black person to win the Caldecott. I wanted to show you one of the illustrations that I thought was very seasonal and appropriate for this time. There are a lot of scary tales. Some of them might be too scary for younger kids, but you can always just skip over those. So, 1980s, the people could fly. The Prisoner of Azkaban. So perfect to read around Halloween. All of them, of course, have the witches and wizards themes, and there's always something memorable happening on Halloween. But this one in particular, I feel, has that Halloween vibe. It's dark, it has the Dementors, it has monsters, my favorite of the bunch so far. I love these versions by Mina Lima. I'm really sad, I don't know if you heard the news, but Mina Lima is no longer going to be illustrating these Harry Potters. I think they're going to republish them, but just using a different illustrator. But I do hope that they keep the same look so that you know it looks nice on your bookshelves. So we'll see, I guess it's just a wait and see kind of game. But I was really sad to hear that, that Mina Lima won't be doing any more of these. Let me just show you some of these illustrations. So Hagrid gets a teaching position. He becomes the Care of Magical Creatures professor and his book that he assigns is the Book of Monsters, and I just thought it was really cool how they did this. Here's an illustration that shows the Dementors, which are so spooky. Such a great dark vibe in this this book. It's just beautiful. Now we are in the 2000s, and the book that I wanted to recommend, or the book series I want to recommend, are the Spiderwick Chronicles. I really loved these, and so did my son, and if any of them could be better for Autumn, I don't know, (laughs) even all over the covers. We are following the Grace family, a mom and three children. We have Mallory is the older sister, and then Jared and Simon are the younger twin boys. They're moving into this old dilapidated Victorian home in Maine. This place is falling apart, the chandelier's coming down, that sort of thing. While their mother is out, they hear what they think is a squirrel running around inside the walls and so they go to investigate and they kind of take this dumb waiter down into this room Jared does anyway one of the little boys and he takes this dumb waiter down into this room that is full of books and it's a hidden room 
and it becomes the beginning of a secret world of fairies and other creatures that that are unseen. I read that Tony Di Terlizzi was influenced by Arthur Rackham, and you can see it in his illustrations. Here is the frontispiece. The only colored illustrations are the very first ones, by the way. But anyway, here's Arthur Rackham's. This is from the Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'm reading it at the moment. You can really see the similarities between the illustrations in the Spiderwick Chronicles and um, Arthur Rackham's work. Oh, I think the one I showed you was from book two, The Seeing Stone. Let me show you the one from the first book. So you see what I mean? How similar it was to the other one. And then the other illustrations are just wonderful. I wanted to show you some of the black and white sketches. And there's an illustration on pretty much every page. There's these full page illustrations. Just these sweet little tiny books. I love them. And spot illustrations. I particularly love this one. 2000s, I recommend the Spiderwick Chronicles. Now we are in the 2010s and I have another book series to recommend for you. And I did speak about these books in my very first video, my first read a book by the decade video, which was all seasons. It wasn't any particular season, but it's been a big hit in our life. And I had to also recommend it not only because it's a great book to read in the autumn, but because the movie version is coming out on Friday. I'm recording this on Wednesday, so actually when this video goes up, it will have already been out. We're going to go see it this weekend and I can't wait. But it's of course the Wild Robot series. It's just such a great book to read in the autumn too, because one of the pivotal things that happens in the first book especially occurs when the geese are flying south for the wind, but they're leaving in the autumn. There was a shipment of robots and this shipment Rex on an island. It's a treed island, lots of pine trees, lots of bears and foxes and very forest type animals. And there's only one surviving robot of this wreck and that is Roz. And Roz is tr at first not accepted by the animals of this island. She's alone, but over time they learn to not only accept her, but also love her. It's very much a story that is a about the out-of-towner, you know, a, a new person comes to town. It's one of those types of stories. It's also a story about the value of nature and relationships. I also think it's a great book for Mother's Day, or to read around Mother's Day. If you don't read it for autumn, then springtime is a good time to read it as well. I love this series. It's been a massive hit in our family, our personal friends. It's also been a huge hit with their children. I really recommend this book series and they're short chapters, easy to read. There's so many illustrations throughout. It's both, by the way, written and illustrated by Peter Brown, but there's spot illustrations like here's some toadstools. It's the island and it shows you how some of the illustrations are. They're kind of wrapped around the text. This is one my son especially loved. This is a Greenland shark, which by the way, they live like 500 years. That's the other thing about these books is that there's a lot of information about nature in them. So now we're in the 2020s and I'm so excited to share this book with you because I have just enjoyed it so much. And it is The Whisperwicks, The Labyrinth of Lost and Found by Jordan Lease, illustrated by Vivian Tu. The cover illustration is by Isabel Usman. I think this is a great book for this time of year because there's two worlds and we have our world and then we have another world called Wreathenwold and this world is very Victorian looking. People dress in Victorian clothes, the buildings look very Victorian. It's a labyrinthine world where if you stray from your home more than one or two streets over, you might get lost and many people have. The homeless people of this world are people who have lost their families and they just wander around trying to find their homes and they never do and they wander forever. It's a world where you can sell the color of your eyes for money if you're desperate and playing cards are the currency. I'd recommend it for autumn is not only because of the Victober, uh, Victorian element, but also because there's a mystery to be solved. Elizabella, who lives in Wreathenwald, her brother has gone missing. And Benjamiah, who lives in our world, receives a doll in the mail, which is more accurately described as a puppet. And um, this puppet is a shape-shifting creature and it changes into different things. It changes into a night jar as well as a capuchin. It leads Benjamiah into this other world of Wreathenwold through the bookshop. And um, Benjamiah is helping 
Elizabella find it, her brother. So here are some illustrations. I don't know if you can see that. And then I wanted to show you an illustration of the puppet that um, he receives in the mail. It also has wonderful references to Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, to Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White. I highly recommend this for 2020s. I like to end these kind of videos with a graphic novel that we've been enjoying. And last year when I did my Autumn Read a Book by the Decade video, I recommended for the 1970s, Banincula, about a vampire bunny and the cat and dog that are in the vampire bunny's life that suspect this bunny of being a vampire and how crazy they get. Just such a charming book. If you have a kid who prefers graphic novels or is just in that space right now, I would suggest reading Banicula, the graphic novel, because it does such a great job of capturing everything that is covered in the story and making it so charming. My son likes to go back and look through this one all the time and so I had to recommend it. Well, that is it. I hope you've enjoyed all these titles. If you've read any of them, let me know in the comments or if any of them look particularly interesting to you, let me know as well. Um, I wanted to tell you, if you've watched to the end of this video, thank you, first of all, because these videos do tend to run a bit long, but if you have watched to the end of this video, um, I wanted to tell you, I don't know if you can see a scar on my face. Um, I just wanted to tell you that um, I, just in case, I didn't want you looking at the scar going, why is that scar on her face? I wanted to give you a reason. I had the smallest, tiniest um, bit of what is called basal cell carcinoma on my face. You could barely see it. It's the slowest moving, most easily curable, I never felt like my life was at risk type of skin cancer. But of course it had to be um, looked after, it had to be, um, I had to have a procedure done to take care of it so that it doesn't become something. So anyway, I actually saw my dermatologist just yesterday and she looked at it and she said it's doing really, really well and that in 12 months I won't even be able to see it. So um, I'm looking forward to looking back at this video and then seeing my face in, tw in a year from now. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you don't mind me sharing. I just, I wasn't sure if I should share it or not, but at the same time, I didn't want you guys looking at it and then not knowing why does she have a scar on her face? <laughs> so, so I thought I would just tell you, if you've watched to the end of this video, um, you're a bosom buddy anyway. In my real life with my friends, I tend to be a very open book. I tell people everything. <laughs> so if you've watched to the end of this video, I feel like you're a bosom buddy as well. So um, anyway, I hope you have a lovely end of September. I'll see you very soon in October. One of my favorite months as well. I love October. And just to let you know, outside of my kitchen, leaves are still pretty dark green they haven't quite changed but i was walking around the neighborhood when i was walking my son to school and i've been seeing orange starting to appear in a lot of the neighborhood trees i look forward to making you guys some videos in october and until then i hope you keep well and i will see you soon bye